Hello class, this is Professor McDermott um, with the first video lecture of History 1112 uh, in which we're going to discuss the Age of Exploration, that is um, the period starting in the late 15th century uh, when Europeans began to move beyond their own borders and to um, explore and also colonize the broader um, world. First, let's take a look uh, at the map of Europe in 1500. You'll notice that there are some things that are quite different from the map of Europe today. For instance, if you look at the bottom right hand corner, the large area in purple called the Ottoman Empire, this was uh, a Muslim superpower which controlled large portions of southeastern Europe, the region known as the Balkans, uh, for many years. Um, Looking at the center of the map uh, and at Italy, you see that the area which is now known as Germany in 1500 um, was officially known as the Holy Roman Empire, and it did have an emperor, but really it was a very loose confederation of a number of small states um, and principalities ruled over by uh, princes, lords, kings, sometimes even by bishops of the Catholic uh, Church. And uh, in Italy you see the same thing, that there's really uh, not a unified Italy in 1500. There's a sort of patchwork quilt of smaller states, the largest of which in the center is called the Papal States. And as you may guess, that meant it was ruled uh, over by the Pope. Um, the leader of the Catholic Church uh, from uh, the Vatican ruling as an absolute uh, monarch. And of course, uh, nowadays the Papal States have shrunk uh, to be uh, a, a small postage stamp size area in the middle of Rome called the Vatican City State. But uh, in 1500, the Pope ruled a great deal of um, central Italy. So um, those regions are very different from the modern era, but if you look farther west, you see four nations, England, France, Spain, and Portugal, that were already taking on uh, the characteristics of more modern nation states. You see that their ter territories are by and large um, unified, and their governments were becoming more centralized by 1500. Um, and so it was these powerful nation states that would really uh, be the vanguard of worldwide exploration and colonization. So what happened in the late Middle Ages that enabled those four countries to consolidate uh, central authority? Well, you have to understand that um, during the Middle Ages, um, power was actually very decentralized and uh, the kings often had much less power than the great lords in their lands, the dukes, the counts, the earls. Um, and partly that was because warfare was carried on by uh, mounted knights, uh, as I'm sure you know, and it was these great lords who uh, produced uh, who paid for the horses, who paid for the armor, and who really put these soldiers um, in the field. And so often there was very little that a king or queen could do during the Middle Ages in Europe uh, without the support of their great lords because they were the military leaders. But that uh, really began to change um, starting in the 14th century when a very important um, invention made by uh, those very creative uh, inventors, the Chinese, made its way to Europe, namely gunpowder. Now, the Chinese uh, mostly used gunpowder for fireworks, but um, Europeans saw the potential of gunpowder to create weapons. And so you start to see uh, during the Middle Ages the invention of artillery, that is uh, large guns, cannon, um, and also uh, primitive firearms, like the one depicted in the picture. This is called an arquebus. Um, it's a type of musket, the ancestor of uh, a modern 
uh, handheld weapon. Um, and so, kings uh, were often the only ones who were wealthy enough to afford um, to create uh, this artillery, to make these guns, and to supply them with gunpowder. And so in the late Middle Ages, the monarchs of Europe begin to use their artillery uh, against the castles of the great lords. So each, each lord would have a strongly fortified castle, which previously uh, would have been impossible, or nearly impossible, to capture. But with a cannon, of course, you can batter um, the castle walls with, uh, with cannonballs and uh, open a breach and then uh, invade the castle. Um, at the same time, uh, the mounted knights quickly uh, become obsolete because uh, kings begin to put in the field larger armies of foot soldiers, that is uh, what we call infantry, um, who are armed with guns. And um, these infantrymen were able to uh, pierce the armor of the knights with their, with their guns. And so pretty quickly um, the old-fashioned knightly warfare becomes obsolete and you start to see um, very large armies of foot soldiers uh, in the service of the king. And so with these two, with these factors, kings <clears throat> in those Western European states were able to consolidate their authority to reduce the power of um, the great lords and to uh, create more centralized um, nation states. And at the same time, you see the rise of new theories of kingly power, uh, what we call royal absolutism. We'll talk more about this later in the course, um, but um, basically this is simply the idea that the king is anointed by God, has absolute authority over his people, um, and essentially his word is law, and no one can, uh, no one can disagree with that or dispute it. Um, this was really a new idea. Um, we often have the idea that in the Middle Ages, kings or queens were all powerful, but that, that simply wasn't true. Um, as I've said, governments were often very decentralized. Um, so this idea of royal absolutism uh, really is a new concept in this early modern period, um, and it has everything to do with the rise of these new powerful states. Well, um, Portugal, uh, tiny Portugal, was actually the first to make great strides uh, in terms of exploring um, the globe. The Portuguese were great um, seafarers, and um, they had uh, some very important um, instruments that enabled them to uh, take to the seas much more confidently. The first was also borrowed from the Chinese, and it was the compass, so that uh, you would always know which direction north was and roughly what direction you were headed in. Um, the other instrument was called the Mariner's Astrolabe, and um, what this instrument could do was tell you um, where you were on the Earth's surface uh, in terms of latitude, that is how far north or south you were uh, of the equator. And so with these instruments, um, the Portuguese took to the seas um, and uh, they were able to create more accurate charts uh, and maps and uh, thus to venture forward uh, much farther than European mariners had ever been able to do before. The Portuguese first uh, set their sights on Africa because it was widely believed in Europe at that time uh, that there were huge supplies of gold uh, on the African continent. And if you look at this uh, image on the right, you can see why. Uh, this is from an atlas from what's now Spain, uh, printed in, or, or drafted in 1375. And you see um, a king in the bottom right-hand side. If you look carefully, you'll notice that he's wearing a golden crown uh, holding a golden scepter, and he has a large nugget of gold um, in his hand. This is uh, a picture of King Mansa Musa of the African Kingdom of Mali uh, in West Africa. 
And so based on uh, information like this, um, the Portuguese really wanted to get onto the African continent and to try to horn in on this um, gold trade. But as the Portuguese explored uh, down the western coast of Africa and made contacts in Africa for trade, they realized that the amount of gold in Africa had been wildly uh, exaggerated. And so Portuguese businessmen began to look for other commodities that they could make money from uh, in Africa. And of course, they hit on human beings. This was the beginning of the African uh, slave trade um, at the hands of the Portuguese. And it's interesting, you know, um, almost every society in human history up to this point in time had owned slaves. But um, prior to this, slavery really had nothing to do with what race you were. Uh, the most common ways to get into slavery were to be captured in war or sometimes um, uh, to be taken into slavery because of unpaid uh, debts. But really, people from anywhere um, could be slaves. It had nothing to do with race. But um, this Portuguese slave trade that starts in the late 15th century really created the modern idea of racial slavery and the, the association of slavery with um, Africans. And we'll see how this uh, unfolded and obviously had a tremendous impact um, in terms of the history of the Americas. But the Portuguese uh, really wanted to go farther than Africa. Their ultimate goal was to make it um, to the Far East, to China, and to what were known as the Spice Islands. Um, later became known as the East Indies, uh, the modern day country of Indonesia uh, in uh, the South Pacific. Why did they want to go there? Well, it was because Europeans had developed a taste for Far Eastern spices um, during the period of the Mongol Empire in the Middle Ages when it was safe to trade over land uh, through Asia uh, with China to obtain uh, to obtain these uh, spices. Why were spices so important? We think, oh, you know, spices are nice, a little pepper on your eggs, a little cinnamon in your oatmeal, that's nice, but it doesn't really seem like a matter of life and death. Um, but for Europeans at this point in time, it really was. And in order to understand why, you have to think yourself back uh, into the conditions of that time. Europeans obviously did not have refrigerators. <laughs> um, they did not have freezers. They did not have uh, very many ways that they could preserve uh, meat. And because people were often living day to day uh, with a very limited food supply, it was very important for them to preserve their food so that it didn't spoil. There were really only two ways to do that. One was to salt it, um, but that taste of salted meat became very tiresome after a while. Um, the other way was to put spices on it. Spices are a natural preservative. Um, and so <clears throat> Europeans had become accustomed to using spices like pepper and, and cinnamon uh, and cardamom to, uh, to preserve their meat from spoilage. And also, let's say the meat did spoil and you had to cook it anyway because it was all you had to eat well you could put more spices on it and uh, hopefully the spices would cover up the rancid taste <laughs> um, so for all these reasons spices were very uh, important and so uh, in 1487 a uh, Portuguese explorer named Bartholomew Diaz uh, set out down the west coast of Africa and he made it all the way um, to the southern tip of Africa before sailing back home. Ten years later, another Portuguese, Vasco da Gama, uh, made it around the Cape of Good Hope, the southern tip of Africa, uh, up the eastern coast of Africa, and all the way to India, where he established important trading contacts, um, 1497 to 1498. 
And uh, the Portuguese were on their way, and uh, over the next um, 15 years, they pretty much were able to corner the market in um, spices from the East Indies. Uh, by 1511, they had taken over a very important city in the East Indies, Malacca, and turned it into their main um, trading uh, depot. So. Um, this mission by the Portuguese was wildly successful. If you look at this map, uh, you can see the voyages of uh, Diaz in 1487 and uh, da Gama, and you can see where the East Indies are, uh, just north of uh, Australia, at the right-hand side of the map. Well, the Spanish, <laughs> next-door neighbors to the Portuguese, were watching all of this, um, with a lot of jealousy and uh, they really wanted to get in on this uh, spice trade uh, as well but the Portuguese uh, seemed to have already taken over uh, the eastern route to the Spice Islands well um, in 1492 an Italian navigator named um, Cristobal Colon better known as Christopher Columbus uh, went to the king and queen of Spain, whose names were Ferdinand and uh, Isabella, with a proposition. Um, he said, I can go to uh, the Spice Islands sailing west. Now, that really wasn't as outrageous as you might think. Uh, a lot of people think that um, medieval Europeans believed that the world was flat, and that actually isn't true. Um, at least for educated Europeans, uh, they all pretty much knew that the world was a sphere. Uh, that had been well known since the time of the ancient Greek uh, astronomers. But uh, most people believed that the globe was too large, uh, really, to sail around it to the west with the ships of the time. Columbus, however, uh, believed that the world was much smaller than it actually is. Um, and so that's why he told the king and queen that he could make it to the East Indies by sailing west for one month only. Now that was a mistake. <laughs> that was an error on the part of Columbus. But um, ultimately it turned out to be a very uh, significant error for the history um, of the world. Because, um, indeed, a month after Columbus set sail on October 12, 1492, um, he, uh, land was sighted from uh, his ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and um, the Santa Maria. And uh, he landed on an island somewhere in the Bahamas. We're, we're not exactly sure which island it was, but somewhere in the Bahamas. <clears throat> and he claimed it for Spain, and he called it San Salvador, Holy Savior. Um, Columbus was a deeply, deeply religious man, a Catholic, who believed that he had a God-given mission um, to uh, explore the globe uh, and to claim it for Spain and for the Catholic uh, Church. And after landing in San Salvador, Columbus explored um, the Caribbean islands um, landed on uh, Hispaniola, which is now, uh, now consists of the countries of Haiti and the Dominican uh, Republic, went to Cuba. Um, and for the rest of his life, Christopher Columbus believed he had done it. He had made it um, to the East Indies. Um, and that's why we call those Caribbean islands the West Indies. And it's also why the people, the native people who were already living um, there and in North and South America, we call Indians, all because of Columbus's um, mistakes. So you see that very important consequences uh, can come even out of our uh, out of our errors. Well, um, at this point, um, a dispute arose between. Um, the Spanish and the Portuguese as to which country was going to have the right to trade and to colonize and to settle uh, which parts of the world. And so 
since both of these were strongly Catholic nations, they naturally um, turned the dispute over to the reigning Pope, whose name was Pope Alexander VI. His name at birth was Rodrigo Borgia. He was a Spaniard. Um, now, if you're Catholic like me, um, <laughs> Pope Alexander VI is one of those popes that we're really embarrassed about. He was perhaps the most corrupt pope um, in the entire history of the Catholic Church. Basically, he looted the church in order to, to uh, support the ambitions of his two children, whose names were Lucrezia and Cesare Borgia. Uh, you may have heard of them. They're quite notorious in European um, history. Now, Pope Alexander VI was a Spaniard, and as a Spaniard, he was very happy to award uh, half of the globe to Spain and the other half to Portugal. So basically what the Pope did was to draw a line of longitude um, 38 degrees west of um, Greenwich, uh, England, 38 degrees west, a line that went all the way around the globe through the North Pole and the South Pole, okay? And he said, basically, Portugal, you can have everything on this side, okay, of the globe, the European side, and Spain, you can have everything on the other half of the globe. Um, and you can trade, and you can colonize, and you can settle. Now, I should say that, uh, of course, that didn't mean uh, the Spanish or the Portuguese could take over countries um, that were already ruled by Christian kings, all right, but if they sailed anywhere and they found a region of land that was not already Christian, um, they could do whatever they wanted there. They could settle, they could colonize, they could take it over uh, for their own nation. <clears throat> and so that's what the Spanish and the Portuguese proceeded to do. Um, they ratified this agreement with a treaty the following year, 1494, called the Treaty of Tordesillas, in which they agreed to move the line a little farther to the west. And that would have consequences in the history of South America. Now, notice that um, there's only one South American country to the east of that line, and that is Brazil, which meant that the Portuguese had the right to settle Brazil, while the Spanish settled everything to the uh, west of the line. And that is why the Brazilians, as I'm sure you know, if you watched the World Cup a couple years ago, uh, that's why the Brazilians speak Portuguese and every other country in Latin America speaks Spanish because of the line that was drawn by Pope Alexander VI in 1493. So the Spanish began uh, to settle their half of uh, the globe and to explore um, eventually South and North um, America. And so Columbus's voyage in 1492 uh, triggered a hugely important uh, sequence of events that historians call the Columbian Exchange. This was an exchange between the Old World and the New World. Uh, it was an exchange of people. It was an exchange of uh, technology, uh, food, plants, and animals, um, culture and customs, religion, uh, and also, very importantly, uh, microbes, diseases. This whole process we call uh, the Columbian Exchange. And it was hugely influential in terms of shaping world history for both the New World and the Old World. So let's look at some of the products that came from America to the Old World, things that had not existed um, in Europe or Asia or Africa uh, before Columbus's voyage. Uh, several types of beans native to uh, the Americas. Navy beans, lima beans, kidney beans came to the Old World from America. Also certain kinds of fruit like uh, blueberries Ah, <laughs> very important. Chocolate. Um, the cacao plant was cultivated by uh, the residents of Central America, the Mayas, and then later the Aztecs. But they didn't eat 
chocolate the way um, that we do. Basically, they would take the cacao and they would mix it with very hot, spicy uh, peppers, and they made a kind of sauce that they poured over their main dishes. So it was not eaten as a dessert, it was sort of a sauce. And if you go to a really good Mexican restaurant, um, even today, if you order mole sauce, you will get this spicy um, chocolate sauce, and it's, um, it's really delicious. Now, of course, the um, Europeans got the idea to combine it with uh, sugar uh, that they got from sugarcane, another very important crop that they started growing, especially in the Caribbean, uh, and, to, and to turn it into a dessert because uh, uh, the Europeans had a sweet tooth, but that, that was not how it was originally eaten. Um, the main food that was eaten by um, native peoples of the Americas was called maize, um, or in English, uh, corn. And uh, this was another very important import uh, from the New World to the Old World, along with um, several kinds of nuts, uh, very important here in Southwest Georgia especially, peanuts, pecans, cashews, these are all native to the Americas. Chili peppers, <laughs> uh, potatoes. Now, this is perhaps the most important uh, food item that came from the New World to the Old World. Uh, sweet potatoes, but especially um, the ordinary white potato. Why? Well, um, potatoes, <clears throat> as vegetables go, they actually have the highest calorie content per ounce of, uh, of any other vegetable. And so basically uh, potatoes are pretty nutritious if you're just trying to stay alive. Um, you can survive on potatoes and uh, they're actually pretty easy to grow in all kinds of soils and all kinds of climates. And so <clears throat> once European farmers began experimenting with growing um, potatoes, they realized they had a very high yield, um, nourishing uh, crop, and the population of Europe really starts to explode because of the potato. Suddenly, people that had been living hand to mouth have this great new food source. Um, they start having more babies. Women are better nourished, so they're more, they're better able to conceive and to go full term with their pregnancies and to feed their children. And have them survive and so family size in Europe really really starts to grow after the potato um, comes uh, to Europe well we'll talk a little bit more about the effects of that at the end of this lecture squash and pumpkins uh, tomatoes okay it's kind of hard to imagine Italian cuisine without the tomato but uh, Italians did not have tomatoes until after the year 1492. <clears throat> the vanilla bean. Ah, tobacco. <laughs> you might say this was the Indians' revenge on the Europeans for what Europeans did to them, perhaps. But the um, Indians used tobacco primarily um, for ritual purposes in religious rites, and also uh, when Indian tribes would make peace with each other, they would smoke um, the peace pipe of tobacco. But uh, shortly after the Spanish started bringing tobacco back from the New World to Europe, it really became a huge craze all over Europe for people to smoke tobacco. Why? Because people believed at that time tobacco was very good for you, um, especially for illnesses of the lungs. So doctors of the day, believe it or not, would often prescribe uh, tobacco to their patients who had asthma to try to cure their asthma. Uh, really extraordinary, but uh, people really thought this was a healthy uh, thing to do in Europe after, uh, after 1500. Um, one sexually transmitted disease that seems to have come from America to the old world um, is the uh, very damaging disease called um, syphilis. Uh, but as we'll see, many more diseases went the other route from uh, the Old World to America. Um, 
But first, let's talk about some of the foods that came over um, from Europe and uh, Africa to the Americas. A lot of fruit trees that didn't exist in the New World. Um, apples, oranges, peaches, bananas. Coffee, uh, which was actually pioneered by the Arabs in uh, the Middle East and had already spread to uh, Western Europe. And then, of course, Europeans would start growing coffee in places like Brazil, Colombia, Jamaica, uh, in the New World. Um, grain products that were staple foods in Europe, like oats and wheat, uh, were not native um, to the Americas. Neither was um, sugar cane. And like I said, uh, sugar cane became the cash crop in uh, the Caribbean, in the West Indies. And this had a huge impact on the lives of many African Americans especially, because um, the majority of African Americans who came from, who were brought from Africa, were put to work tending sugarcane. It was uh, very hard labor. The life expectancy was very short in these uh, sugarcane fields in the Caribbean. Also, a large number of domesticated animals. Cats did not exist in America before Columbus. Neither did cattle, oxen, chickens, goats, sheep, or pigs. And um, these farm animals would have a tremendous impact on the lives of the Indians. First, because uh, they were often very disruptive to the Indians' uh, fields and where they had planted their crops, Europeans' cattle or, or goats or pigs would run wild and trample the natives' crops. Uh, that was a common grievance in the early years of settlement. But then, of course, later, Indians began to cultivate these animals. Uh, some of them become um, workers on cattle ranches and so forth, so this, this would have a big impact on their lives as well. But the domestic animal that would totally change Indian culture uh, was the horse. Now, believe it or not, there were no horses in North or South America um, before 1492. The Spanish were the first to bring them over. Um, the Indians were terrified of them at first. Um, as you'll see on the Cortez video, so I'll hold off on explaining that. But over time, Indians uh, adopted horsemanship, and many tribes, especially in North America, um, used uh, allowed horses to totally transform their culture. And if you watch old Western movies, you know that our typical Hollywood view of an Indian is um, Plains Indian riding a horse, dragging a teepee, chasing the buffalo. <laughs> um, but that stereotypical view of Indian culture did not exist before Columbus. It was something that developed um, over time after the initial uh, Spanish settlement. But the European import uh, and the African import that uh, would affect Indian culture most dramatically uh, was undoubtedly disease, many diseases um, that became epidemic and wiped out huge numbers of Native Americans, including the bubonic plague, gonorrhea, uh, the flu, uh, the African type of malaria, which uh, is the most deadly type of malaria, um, also measles and mumps, which were very deadly diseases in those days. Um, scarlet fever, whooping cough, uh, yellow fever, but the most devastating of all, um, smallpox. Uh, and I'm going to show you an image. This is from the Aztecs of Mexico. Um, a depiction of the effects of smallpox when the smallpox hit the Aztec people. Uh, basically, smallpox <clears throat> is like a very bad case of the chickenpox. Um, accompanied by a very high fever, but essentially you have it all over your body and the pustules uh, swell, they're angry red boils, and eventually they burst. Um, and so if you manage to survive the smallpox, you are scarred usually over your whole body for um, your entire life. It was a, a terrifying disease um, 
especially to the Indians. Now, why, uh, why were the Indians so susceptible to these diseases from the old world? Well, if you uh, uh, are in a, a, a pre-medical field, you may have the answer to this question already. But basically, North and South America had been completely cut off from the rest of the world for more than 10,000 years, okay? And with, well, with one exception, about the year 1000, the Vikings, led by Leif Erikson, did manage to establish a foothold uh, in Greenland and Newfoundland, and even to, uh, made it to um, North America. But uh, that had little lasting impact. For the most part, the Americas had been completely isolated uh, for ten, uh, more than 10,000 years, and that meant that um, the Indians had no immunity whatsoever to many diseases um, from Europe, Africa, and Asia because they had never been exposed to them. Um, people in the old world, many of them, had already been exposed to all of these diseases and uh, had built up some immunity. But when they hit the New World, uh, it had absolutely devastating um, impact. And if you look at the documents about exploration, uh, many of them say the same thing. You know, the explorer, the European explorer will say, well, we arrived in this village um, and began to uh, establish contacts and then about a week later all of the people began to get sick and most of them died um, now put yourself in the Europeans mindset for a moment how would you interpret that event now of course um, European medicine had no knowledge of microbes bacteria viruses any any of the causes of these diseases they had no idea what caused them so how would you interpret that? Well, if you were a devout Christian, like many of these uh, European explorers, you would certainly be tempted to think that perhaps God had inflicted these diseases on these people. Um, in fact, that might be the only plausible explanation based on what you knew. And so, the epidemics really provided Europeans with a justification for taking over the land. The idea was, well, God is wiping out these people, getting rid of them, so that we can come in and take the land. He must mean for us to take over uh, these, these nations. So uh, the epidemics became a very powerful force justifying European colonization in the New World. Some historians believe that a, up to 90% of the native population, 90% were wiped out by post-contact diseases, part of the Columbian exchange. And you can imagine the devastating impact that this must have had on people. Imagine if suddenly 90% of your friends, your family members, your teachers, uh, your religious leader, you know, uh, suddenly wiped out all at once. Um, what impact would that have on society, on, on communities? Um, basically, things really began to fall apart for the native peoples, and so it meant that they were not in, in a position in many places to put up much resistance um, to um, the Europeans. It also meant that in many cases they would consolidate themselves into new tribes. We'll see later how this happened in um, Virginia. Um, after the, the, the post-contact epidemics uh, hit, uh, creating new political units in a desperate attempt to survive. Well, um, over time, um, the Spanish tr set their sights beyond the Caribbean uh, and on the mainland of Central America. And uh, this really began in 1519 with a conqueror named Hernan um, Cortez. And I'm not going to go into great detail about Cortez because you have a video to watch uh, during this module that I think does a great job of, exp of uh, explaining how Cortez was able to conquer Mexico with fewer than 600 Spanish soldiers ranged against hundreds of thousands of warriors commanded by the Aztec Emperor um, 
Montezuma. Um, basically, Cortez uh, was able to do this with the help of a lot of native peoples who allied themselves um, to him. Um, by 1521, he had accumulated about 100,000 native allies and was able to take over uh, the Aztec Empire, uh, which became known as New Spain. Uh, why were these native people so eager to help Cortez against other Indians? Well, if you look at the image here, you can see why. The Aztecs practiced human sacrifice, and so they would often kidnap uh, members of other tribes. And um, if you've ever seen the movie Apocalypto, <laughs> you've seen a great depiction of this, how they would kidnap people, drag them to this temple, pull them up the stairs, and then at the top of the stairs, a priest carrying a stone knife would plunge his knife into the chest of the struggling victim and lift out the still beating heart as an offering to the Aztec's sun god. Well, obviously, uh, the native peoples didn't like being human sacrifices, <laughs> and so many of them joined Cortez and helped him to conquer the country by the year 1521. But again, uh, you'll get more details on this from the video, and you'll have some discussion questions about it. So I'll just uh, I'll just leave it for the video. I think it uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, well, the aftermath of Cortez's conquest <clears throat> uh, was manifold. Uh, at first, many Indians were enslaved. Now, eventually, um, the Pope of a later time decreed that uh, Indians should not be enslaved. And that was a very well-intentioned statement, but um, the ultimate result was that more and more Africans were enslaved instead of Indians. But at first, many Indians were enslaved, certainly exploited um, for their labor, so put to labor in fields, but also in mines, uh, silver mines especially, uh, gold mines as well. Uh, brutal, brutal back-weight-breaking uh, work. Uh, a lot of exploitation, but also <clears throat> the Spanish deeply desired to convert all the native peoples to Christianity, excuse me, to Catholic Christianity, and so they also sent over many priests um, to carry out this task of conversion. Um, sometimes the priests would uh, work against the interests of the government of New Spain if they thought the Spanish were exploiting the Indians um, too much. Other times they would cooperate, but um, eventually um, most of the native people did become, did become Catholic, and of course uh, most of Latin America is Catholic um, to this day, although Protestantism has been making large inroads in recent years. Um, after Cortez in 1533, another conqueror or conquistador, uh, is the word in Spanish, named uh, Francisco Pizarro, uh, did the same thing to the mighty Inca Empire in South America and what is now um, Peru, also a very advanced, very rich civilization. Uh, Pizarro conquered them in 1533, and the whole process began to spread itself to South America as well. And the Spanish really reaped huge, huge monetary rewards from this um, because there was a great deal of gold and silver in the Aztec and um, Inca empires. And so uh, Spain became fabulously wealthy, uh, especially on the silver from the New World. They began importing large quantities of it into Europe. Now, if you have an economics background at all, or business, um, you may know what happens when the money supply increases dramatically and suddenly. Um, what happens is inflation. That is, the prices of things go way, way up. Um, and so uh, there's a massive inflation in Europe as a result of the conquest of the New World prices of many commodities go up drastically. Um, so imagine the situation. We already said the population is increasing drastically because of the new food crops 
But at the same time, life is becoming harder for ordinary people because things that they need to buy are suddenly more expensive. So what are you going to do? Um, you have a bunch of kids, um, your family's growing, but you can't afford to buy things that you might need for them. What are you going to do? Well, many of these people, the poor people in Europe, decided to go elsewhere, namely to America. <laughs> And so you see, it's like a never-ending cycle. Silver to the old world, causing inflation, sending more and more people to the new world, claiming more and more land uh, from the Indians. The cycle uh, just went on and on. Well, that's the end of the first lecture. I encourage you, if you have any questions or if there's anything that you didn't understand about the lecture, to please... Uh, email me and I'll be happy to clear anything of that sort up.